Welcome everyone to the Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. I'm Sherilyn Parsons, founder and executive director, and I want to thank the Consulate of Sweden in San Francisco for supporting this program. Um, we're thrilled to bring together two of the most interesting and exciting voices in music today, Fantastic Negrito and Timbuktu. Fantastic Negrito is a two-time Grammy Award-winning blues, R&B, and roots artist based in Oakland. His latest album, Have You Lost Your Mind Yet, uh, came out this past August. Um, while critics rave about his music, fans on YouTube cut to the chase. These songs are, quote, medicine for the soul. You remind us that we are all brothers. And, quote, this is the art the world should be experiencing right now. Fantastic Negrito's life story is nearly as riveting as his music. Running away into the streets of Oakland when he was 12, a big record contract, a car accident and coma, a chicken and marijuana farm. And that's before he reinvented himself as Fantastic Negrito. Timbuktu is one of Sweden's most well-known hip hop artists. He's won eight Swedish Grammy Awards and has performed all over the world, from Harlem to Africa to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremonies. His life story embodies multiracial identity and a search for belonging. Born to interracial American parents in Sweden, Jason Diakat. Tay um, is part Swedish, American, Black, White, Cherokee, Slovak, and German. His award-winning memoir, A Drop of Midnight, recently published in English, describes his journey, physical and emotional, into understanding his own identity, from South Carolina slavery to 21st century Sweden. When I met Timbuktu a few months ago, I was reminded of Fantastic Negrito, whom I'd also just met. Not so much because of their music, which is very different, but because of their similarity of generosity, kindness, and, dare I say, heart. So here we are. So I wanted to bring them together. And here we are now in the midst of a global pandemic and a time of racial awakening, a reckoning, a time of racial reckoning. Um, so we'll invite them to talk for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then we'll play some clips um, from their performances, and uh, they'll talk about that. So does that sound good, you guys? Yeah? Absolutely. All, all yes. right. All right. <laughs> so just to, just to get started, um, what matters most to you today, and how are you exploring that creatively? Um, so fantastic, Degrito. Let's start with you, and I'm going to go away for a while, but uh, we'll, we'll be here and play your clips when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you so much for that uh, the wonderful introduction. That was great. Um, what's going on, uh, brother man from Sweden, Timbuktu, the one and only? I'm good. I'm good, brother. I'm yeah, just happy good. to be here, you know. Yeah, that's a good thing. Gratitude is amazing, man. I always tell yeah. people, they're like, what's your religion? I say, my religion is gratitude. That's the best, you know. That's the best my, mother, <clears throat> my mother would always say, uh, you know, don't be proud, be grateful. Yeah, uh, bless because she knows gratitude. Herself. Yeah, she's like gratitude in the in the universe of emotions. Other than love, gratitude is go is going to be the one that's going to be most prolific for you. Yeah, you know, I mean, pride gratitude. can't get you. Pride can't get you much other than maybe into trouble. I get you a spiritual ass whooping. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, gratitude yeah. is just like you don't have. Man, you don't really have time to be bitter when you you're thankful for it all, whether it's good, yeah. bad, ugly you know, illness, whatever it is, like, I just always, I feel, you know, gratitude, because then you, you're having the opportunity for some shit to yeah, happen. Because exactly, if shit happens, that's great. When, when it, it doesn't happen, sometimes that's, that's not good. Um, gratitude is also an open emotion, right? Yeah, Whereas pride totally. is a little more closed. Pride, pride is like, you're finished, you're done. You're, you're right yeah. here. Whereas gratitude, yeah. you're still open. And that's, oh, 100%. that's what you say, that's why shit can happen. Yeah, yeah, and pride. I, I gotta say, I, I'm, you know, I didn't think growing old would be as 
I want to say the word nice, but it, you know, as nice as it's been so far, you know, I speak to my dad, he's turning 80 this year. He says, you know, no, tell him happy birthday. Yeah, I will. I what, will. When's his birthday? You no, know, his birthday is December 17th. He's a Sagittarius. So he's Cap oh, Sagittarius. Sagittarius. Uh, okay. Yep. He's right on the cusp there. Right. Uh, but he, he always says, well, you know, getting old is, yeah, it might be fine in the age you are, but wait until you get, you know, you hit 70. But, but yet and still, I find growing old because, uh, just really uh, a wonderful experience because, you know, my vision is just broadening and understanding something like gratitude is one of those just aspects of growing old that I feel like it has given me that understanding that gratitude is better than pride or, you know. Yeah, no, 100% growing old is a blessing. I mean, when I was young, I was into some real stupid stuff. So it's like, it's beautiful to... uh have gone through it, have survived it. Yeah. And I look at it as now I'm an elder, you know, in yeah. the village, you know, yeah. and I'm like, I get to <clears throat> pass on to some of these youngsters, um, you know, some much needed knowledge, you know? And uh, it's funny, just the other day, my nephew, you know, he's a um, 20 year old dude, tall, mm -hmm. good looking dude, strong, adrenaline, all that, you know, uh, he, uh, he had a traffic accident and you know, he ran into one of these dudes who was, you know, was a white man, not saying that mm -hmm. uh, white people are bad or anything like that, because, we you know, we're only 13 percent. We need white people. <laughs> we we only 13 percent in America. <laughs> yeah, I always yeah. tell yeah. tell uh, my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters that. But but he was one of these dudes who was uh, since he was pissed about the accident, he got on the phone and was like, yeah, I'm being threatened. And this guy has assaulted me, which I call. It's an attempted modern day lynching because exactly. what he was doing, he was calling, he was in a, my nephew was going through a white area called Mill Valley. And thank God there were good white people there who were like, wait a minute, uh uh, bro, you mm. tripping. He did not threaten you. Nothing mm. happened. You're lying. So that's one of the great things, you know, is for this young man, like all I've been telling him his whole life, he's got a temper, you got to remain calm. You have to be articulate. Right. When people are coming at you crazy, you have to show that you are the voice of calm. And because he did that, he was very articulate and very calm. And this, you know, middle-aged white dude's going crazy lying when the police showed mm. up mm. in this mm -hmm. all-white area. They had a very different attitude towards him. So I, I'm saying this because we're talking about growing old, and I'm very happy mm. that um you know, I've been telling this youngster this his whole life, like giving him the tools to navigate through a construct of um, uh, racism. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that what that man was doing was activating his he was activating his privilege, which exactly. could have had could have had lethal consequences for you. Now, Absolutely, man. In the state, which, which really, it, you know, you remember the uh, it was must have been what? Early June, like right after George Floyd, where uh, girl in the park, Central exactly. Park. Amy, Amy same Cooper, yeah. and 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 uh, and the bird watching dude that was there, and yeah. how she did the same thing. Yeah, and that really, you know, it got, in a in a way, of course, what happened to George Floyd was beyond brutal, and just the, right. it's just heart. It you know, it just ripped me apart watching that, and as it did to everyone who saw it, you know. Yeah, but in a way, on a on the scale of daily life, it was just something new uh, hearing about this Amy Cooper because I was like, whoa, okay, so she just activated something like that without thinking about the consequences for this man, which could well, have been lethal. Same as your nephew, you know? Let me tell you, bro. That's you know, I how got people three are words. operating? Yeah, tell me. I got three words for you. Welcome <laughs> to America. Because, <laughs> well, even well, you know, I'll be honest with you, that... The, man, that's normal. Man. That could happen. I mean, I that could happen here too. That could happen oh, really? here too. And that in Sweden and, and that yeah, the carrying wow. of privilege in that way is definitely something that exists here. The difference is though that there are very few instances of police using lethal force. Right. Uh, they will use force. It just won't be lethal. You know. Well, see, this police, is a police in general state. don't kill. Yeah, they don't. This kill is a police state here, man, and it's like. Yeah. You know, this is a, I always tell people, man, this is a state sponsored agency paid for by tax payers that arbitrarily execute um, African American men that are unarmed based on their fear. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say that to like the world. And I've been screaming it and I'm going to keep saying it. This is mm -hmm. new for everybody else. 
everybody else is shocked and appalled. But, you know, this is something that's been going on here since I was a child. It's something and my father felt it and my grandfather. Mm -hmm. It's um, Mm -hmm. it's a construct. You know, it's yeah. in the DNA of the, of the system. And, and uh, you know, now there's just cell phones. But, man, you've been going through this, you know, as long as I can remember. But see, out there, uh, here's the thing uh, is yeah. you have the tools. One mm-hmm. thing my father, I got to give him credit for, he was an um, abusive tyrant and a wonderful man and all these things mm-hmm. all mixed mm-hmm. up. But he did always tell me, if the police stop you, this is what you got to do. You got a yes, sir, and no, sir, and the death because they will blow your head off. I was six hey. when my father told me that. I'm like, what's he talking about? They'll blow you. Uh, huh? And he kept mm-hmm. telling me and kept telling me. Then we moved from New England to East Oakland. And then I was 14 years old and a policeman pointed a gun at me. And I was like, "Uh oh, this is what he's talking about. So immediately mm-hmm. I went into that tool bag that my yeah. father had been preaching to me. And this is what the importance of elders and community is. And, mm-hmm. you know, where I see myself is that I was able to reach into that tool bag and, and, and uh, I don't say confront, but deal and navigate through this, these police, which shouldn't be an obstacle if we have the tools to deal with them. Yeah. I mean, and speaking to uh, the story you were telling about your nephew, that, yeah. that having the tool of just, I don't know where my cell phone is right now, but being able to pull out a phone and start filming it as yeah. evidence, you know, um, that's one of the most groundbreaking things to happen to black people to happen to black people around the world in, yeah. you know, since racism was invented. Like we uh, told because, you. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, my dad, I, I called, it. I called my dad, you know, after, after the, uh, the murder of George Floyd happened and, and I just to ask him if he had heard about it, you know, how he felt about it. My dad's from Harlem. And he said, you know, it's painful. He said the same thing you're saying. Of course, this is nothing new. This has been going nothing on new, always. Man. And then he told me a story of when he was 18 and he was driving his brother to school in Harlem and how he was stopped by the cops. I said, they t- two boys, basically, one 18 right. year old and his younger brother. Well, they don't uh, care. Six years younger. So he was 12. And and this cop pulls out a gun. I think he said it was 19, uh, 1958. Mm-hmm. Cop pulled out a gun and shoved it in in his face, you know. That's routine, and, yeah. So to him, and just think about that. That was 1952. See, right, yeah, bro. It's like, yeah. But you know what? Yeah, when in talking about this, also, which is great to talk to you, brother. Great to yeah, talk man, to you. the same, and Xavier. I, See, and this my, is the my, blessing that yeah, that we can that we can exchange ideas and stories and hear each other and speak to each other in these times that's what i need to to get through this right and your perspective is unique because you are also african american i mean your father mm. mm-hmm. is from here so you have you have that whole perspective you know what i mean and then you're mm. raised in sweden right yeah i was born so it's, and it's interesting it, it's I, I i'm enjoying listening to it um, mm-hmm. One of the things I wanted to say is that's so important. We're talking about our elders here and our fathers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did run away when I was 12. That's all true. My dad was, he was a tyrant, man. He was mm. insane. But he, my dad was born in 1905. Wow. My, that's my the same was, time. My granddad was born in 1907. So, okay, your dad, yeah. He was also, he, he had was lived. 30, he had he lived. was 33 years older than my mother. Wow. So once he found religion, he turned into a tyrant, man, and he was okay. relentless. And I think he meant well. I always want to give oh, him the, the credit that he meant well, but it, you know, it just wasn't good. And plus, I was who I was. I'm like you. I was an artist, yeah. so I was like, religion. That doesn't sound fun to me. I'm like, yeah. no, I want to get out there and I want to hit the streets. The streets look beautiful, you know. So <laughs> I just want to um, preface, you know, that. But by saying that, so I'm not blaming. I don't like blaming. And I wanted to talk about, like, even the racism thing. One thing my father always taught me was like, hey, yeah, there's racism out there. Okay, good. Now, go out there and outdo everybody. Don't ever right. let anybody stop you. He would say, if the, these police I'm telling you about, if they're your problem, then that means you got a problem. And I was like, damn, you know, he gave me so much game. And I think that that's not my responsibility because although there is this, concept of racism and it ain't gonna stop me it ain't gonna stop you 
It ain't going to stop a lot of people, but it may stop other people. And we have to have the empathy and compassion to pass that message on. Man, people need the tools, bro. I'm telling you, it's like this. I was growing up, I was in the streets, hustling, selling drugs, all that, watching my friends get killed. My brother shot in the head at 14. I seen him lying there. You know, my cousin killed right on the streets of liberal, progressive Bay Area, California, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, My best friend killed in a barber shop. I can go on and on, and it's going to sound like Iraq. And this was Mm. 25, 30 years ago. Mm. That's how how long ago it is. But I want to say this, that also it's a side of, you know, we need healing, but we also need healing's best friend in my world is accountability. Right. Because healing and accountability, when they get together, that means things are going to happen for the good. Like we got to go into our own communities. We got to look at ourselves. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing to help perpetuate maybe some of the uh, negative images of, of, of blacks? And that's not popular for me to say, but that's why I'm fantastic. Negrito, Cause I'm going to say it <laughs> and they can be that. mad at me and they can whatever, mm-hmm. but it goes hand in hand. There is police brutality. There is the construct of racism. We are treated like second class citizens still, Mm -hmm. but we got to know that and we got to be prepared for that. And we got to prepare our kids and prepare our daughters and prepare Mm -hmm. our sons and prepare our nephews so that we have, so that we can be alive. Mm -hmm. We can be alive to talk to each other because you do, you need the tools. Man, I've been stopped so many times by the police and at Mm -hmm. 14 getting a gun pulled on me. That wasn't the last time, man, that's happened. What? Maybe 10 times. I don't know. And, how many states, you know, California. And it could still South happen Central. to you. I mean, yeah, it, it could happen, happen to you at any moment, you know. Any moment. But let me, so, let me, let me yeah. ask you, uh, my brother, you know, racism in, in its American iteration, because of course racism exists, you know, it's a global phenomenon, a global right. construct where it, it, it's like written into the capitalist uh, uh, right. system, right? It works. Uh, so, That's why. so it's a part of the American. It's a part of the American of uh, the American DNA. You know, yes. the racism that we're seeing today. It's been there since the founding of the nation. But wow. another, another beautiful aspect of uh, the American DNA is something that you're channeling in your music. You know, the blues. You know, obviously thinking about that construct of racism and how that perspective and how it's, how it's shaped everything in American society, more or less, you understand why the blues was born in America and not Sweden, you know, even though we have our, Sweden has its versions of, you know, soliloquizing and lamentations over life, all you, it's a part of the human experience that need to, to channel uh, uh, pain, sorrow, but also joy. Tell me how, you know, coming up as you did, East o- first Massachusetts, Massachusetts, then East Oakland. Like, how did you find the blues at that time when I'm, I'm guessing everybody was finding like rap music and, and you know, maybe uh, club music or uh, things like that? Well, that's a very good question. And man, that's a deep, that's these, are, we're going into some deep waters here. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let, let's, let's roll up our sleeves and first, I like, give one, sh- one thing straight is this yeah. hey man we all found the blues because you know the blues found us because right. we come you me we come from this tradition of people who had to survive mm. the people your father's people brother mm. brother they had to mm. survive the most uh, subhuman treatment ever can you imagine somebody knocks on your door and sells your daughter can you imagine someone knocks on your door and says, uh, I need your wife for the night? Mm-hmm. Could imagine you and I are siblings and someone can sell me and like cattle. You know what I mean? Worse than cattle, worse than dogs. At least you let the dog in the house. So we came from this, this, this lineage of human expression and survival. So the blues found all of us. So I want to say this when I was a youngster, I would hear the blues and going to my Southern relatives in the South and they were all old people on a farm. They were old, bro. And I would be like, I'm not interested in this music. I wasn't, but it was getting into my DNA. And what I didn't know is I was listening to that music 
when I was listening to De La Soul back then, when right. I was listening to right. NWA, all that, the blues, what I, I call my it's music. foundational. Yeah, I call my music black roots music. I don't even call it blues. Somebody right. else called it that, and I'm like, oh, you, I get a Grammy for this? Okay, yeah, blues. So let me tell you, <laughs> I call it black yeah. roots, because what it is, is it, 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 it's, it's funk, it's mm-hmm. rock, it's mm-hmm. soul, it's punk, it's rhythm. It's blues, it's alligator shoes, cornbread stomps, organ, shouts. Mm-hmm. Um, it, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's all these it's things. God, and, and it's it, religion, it, listen, it's, uh, all it's whiskey, it's everything. Yep, it's church yep. without the religion even, you know? Yeah. It's, it's um, <laughs> yeah. hey, and it gave birth to electronic music, techno music, uh, hip hop music. Oh. Um, you can go down the line, reggae music. All. So the yeah. thing is, that's transatlantic slave trade that happened is that uh, that affected all of popular culture across the globe so let's say that so your question is how did i found it it found me when i was young i was my first record deal i mean i was on tour with de la soul i wasn't really and i was on in the rest of development i was in that world i wasn't Mm -hmm. really doing what people call blues i was like an r&b act first time but for me i was always chasing that ghost because it was there i didn't I had to fail and go through life and lose my, lose my playing hand. You know, all these things had to happen to me so that I could be ready to do the music I'm doing now, which I call Black Roots, which is definitely, uh, you know, based in blues and all these names, all this music that I, that I named. So it just found me because I started doing it only five years ago, six years ago. I picked up the guitar. I just walked down to the street and started playing because I got really sick of the music business and you know, it's this ivory tower tells us how you got to look, how you got to sound, how old you got to be, you know, what repressed fantasy some person of power has says that you fit into this category and you're a rapper stand over here. You're going to talk about gangsters. You're going to talk about killing each other. You're an R&B singer. You're going to talk about a uh, screwing and you're a poet and you're whatever, you know, I, I got so sick of it that I thought, you know what? I don't want any of this anymore. Uh, middle aged, I done lived nine lives. I'm about to play into the streets. I don't even want to be famous. I just need some therapy. I just need mm-hmm. the music to get into my soul and talk to the people getting off the train. And that's how it all happened, man. You know, I didn't I didn't plan mm-hmm. any of this. When I was younger, I wanted it all. Complete yeah. narcissist. I want to be famous. I want I was signed it with uh, Snoop and Pac and I all I met all those people. I was on the same label with them back then. And um, Nine Inch Nails, all these groups. So back then, I wanted at this age, I was like, you know, I just want to contribute some. I had no mm-hmm. idea people would be interested in uh, the music I do, which is multifaceted, multi-layered. Just mm-hmm. yeah, that's how it happened. I, I, I'm tripping off the fact that your last album is called "Have You Lost Your Mind Yet," and that's even before the world was introduced to the coronavirus. You know, well, I know uh, why. Uh, I'm gonna tell you why. Yeah. Because hey, we've been sick a long time, mm, mm. and so my finger was just on this pulse. I was like, "Yeah, I'm about to." I like to be like, because I'm a street performer. So I'm like, "Let me see." Oh man, we are. Ooh, oh, <laughs> oh no! So I'm like, this time it's you. Yeah. It's me. And I'm like, mm-hmm. it's my cousin. I'm like, man, we are fucked up. And what's fucking us up is this whole, it's social media. And and um, we're like letting our value system, even for our kids, you got a beautiful two-year-old daughter, like be careful. Mm-hmm. Like that YouTube and that monster of social media, likes, how many likes do I have? Can I post selfies? Oh, do people like me? Am I, am I okay? Oh, there's news coming at me from everywhere. Oh my God. You know, oh, black people being killed by the police. Oh, man. OK, let me keep on eating my breakfast. Oh, 13 people got killed in Kentucky. Like we're just taking mm-hmm, all this stuff mm-hmm. in like it's nothing. I don't know about what is it like in, in Sweden? Like what I is, mean, what's it, the, you, you, you know, you're so right on it. Just remaining, you know, keeping your spiritual fortitude in this right. modern time that we live is uh, to me, it's it's such a challenge and i'm looking at my daughter she's only you know two years old yeah man thinking that you know she's still just this very uh uh uh, she's this like the 
the the cleanest, most honest, just she's deeply human, right? Right. There's no, she has no filters. She doesn't even know about filters yet. I see how she's, I see how she's starting to learn like certain manipulations, like fake crying and stuff like that. So she's starting to get, get her game a bit, you know, to, to get what she wants all geared towards survival. Oh, a daughter too, when I, look out. When I think about what her path will be like, like what life is like, you know, luckily I think, you know, memory is interesting. I think we're designed in such an ingenious way, human beings, right? I can't, I can't remember being two years old. I can of course right. remember being, you know, I have certain memories from maybe four or five. And, right. and I'm like, wow, I'm talking to this person every day who's so clean, she's in a state where she, her brain isn't even storing this, or it's stored, but deep into the unconscious. You know? Right, but right. It's, but now's the time when she's being made. And- Well, you know what you should do? Yeah, I, Write songs around her. That's the best. You know, looking at her, it makes me want to like move right. out into the forest and just be around trees and and water and and animals and just like it's the best. keep her away from keep her away from anything that we have built because what we have built really tests the spirit and it 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 you know I grew up in Sweden my dad's uh, African American my mom's a white American two beautiful oh, both people. Americans I, I, I heard that That's yeah different. they're both American and I grew up here in a time when you know Sweden in the eighties I'm born in seventy five I went to school in the eighties Sweden was just uh, very a, a very homogenous country very white you know right i'd say sweden is sweden in its whiteness is one of the like whitest countries i've i've ever been to or ever <laughs> known right? right you know because if you come to sweden as an italian like if you go to the states as an italian today you you're still white you know or if you're iranian right. you're still you're still white you come to sweden no way bro you have to be like you have to meet a higher criteria of whiteness to to really truly get in anyway so i came up here and being a, a being a black kid with brown skin uh, here was uh even at the age of six nobody really had to tell me and my dad would always tell me at home like you're a black man be proud you're a proud you know i want you to grow up and be a proud black man and be proud of your heritage be proud right. of who you are he taught me about you know African-American culture. He gave me the books. He played me the music and my mom did too. God bless her. You know, she yeah. was yeah, it, almost even more formative. She gave right. me those books, Malcolm X's autobiography that really changed my life in a sense. How old were you when open, you read Malcolm X? I was, uh, she gave it to me when I was 14. I read it and it, okay, it cool. just opened my eyes. I was ready wow. for it too. You know, okay, it opened yeah, my eyes going, to sorry, the point. Yeah. It opened yeah. my eyes to the point that I'm, I'm reading and I'm, I'm just at the kind of the first half of the book uh, and Malcolm is still deeply, uh, 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 deeply into the nation is just introduced to the nation of Islam and is learning about their beliefs. And at one point I said, you know, to my mom, like, I can't sit down and have dinner with you. You're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're white, you know, you're white. And, and I'm sorry, I love it. The, the white, the white <laughs> man is the devil. And she's like, well, then, so no dinner for you. You know, you can hang out in your room. And then whenever you're hungry enough, then I'm sure you'll be with the devil, devil, right? <laughs> yeah, then you'll, be able to, then you'll be able to eat with the devil again. And, and then great. I kept reading the book. I kept reading the book. And, and when, when towards the end uh, of the book, Malcolm reaches the, the, the realization that he recognizes the brotherhood of man through, through true Islam, right? Or through the, the right, global, no, you're, yeah. but, right. Right. Uh, that's, so, that's so luckily, story. and I think my mom, my mom knew that, you know, but let him just keep reading. He'll get to it just like, you know, Malcolm did, yeah, that's but, priceless. Um, but even so, so I grew up, you know, uh, in a time where being, uh, black in Sweden was something quite unusual. And I was very, it was, I was very visible and I was, uh, I was bullied by, by a gang of, of kids in my school every day, for the first six years of school. So all that, like all that shaped me, you know? And yeah, it really, all that does uh, shape you. It, 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 shape it hurt you. my spirit. It took me a long time to 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 heal from that. What well, a part of my healing from that was writing my book. It's called A Drop of Midnight. And nice. yeah, that's a great title. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I love it. I think uh, I've always been attracted to. Title. I've always I liked it. the word. I've always liked the word midnight. The time. Uh, yeah. It's a, such a creative time of day, right? Um, Is it on audio books too? It is. It is actually Amazon, Kindle, all that. Yeah, 
on Amazon uh, Kindle, so you can get you know it tonight. Well, we'll have Sherilyn send you a copy, you know, yeah. or, or send you a link to the to the audio. Yeah, bro, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I think when you said the um, title, I, I was like, oh, good. I love titles. I'm like, damn, that's yeah, yeah, a good yeah, title. Yeah, right. <laughs> Great title. But, so it says it all. I, yeah. It says and it what all, I wanted yeah. to say about that, and this is all getting back to what you were talking about with the blues, was I I grew up here, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, all my cousins were in the States. We'd go every summer and sometimes over Christmas. But I uh, you know, I never really got to know my my grandfather and my grandmother on my on my but mom's why? side. And um because they passed when I was quite young. Oh, okay, all right. So how did your how did young. your um how did your American family receive you? You're kind of exotic, I'm sure. Like, oh man. Well, you know, I I, I had this. You know, my uncle calls me Puerto Rico because of my <laughs> hair is not you know tight. tight oh yeah, that's funny. Know, like my curls are a little loose. You know. Yeah, yeah. So that's I would funny. you know I would feel he'd be like, hey, Puerto Rico, my nephew. But you know, he loves me. I know he loves yeah, me. Yeah, but yeah. I was definitely you know, and then I'd be with my mom's family. You know, white middle class Americans. I was super visible. I, it was like it was. Uh, and they would also, they also loved me and treated me well. Nobody ed- would ever say anything, you yeah. know, uh, uh, derogatory or anything, yeah. derogatory or never make me feel like I wasn't, you know, but oh. I saw this and it leaked into me. And I, I, I started gauging myself and in, in, in these different situations, I was learning my, you know, I was learning my game, how to navigate, you know, who I was and trying to, trying to realize what, which leg do I stand on? And I think it made me a, a I think it made me a, a richer person in the end because Definitely, I, can, man. I can I can bridge between these different islands of experiences, right? But so but when writing this book, writing about my grandfather, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather's grandfather, my ancestors who were enslaved, uh, writing about all my family and seeing I, I came to really realize and feel the fact that me existing and my daughter now existing is the result of all this survival that you were just speaking about absolutely this c- courage resilience love and 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 uh and being smart to survive to, and to survive your too. black skin and forgiveness forgiveness all is, these yeah. things you know writing about it made me feel less alone right because i felt like wherever i am now the ancestors are with me, right? Yeah, I have these beautiful. spirits. I have this to pass on, right? Beautiful. And, that's no, I what love I, that. and it made me think about that with hearing you speak about the music because, you know, you say, I, I, I love that you call it black roots, right? That's what I call it. Because black roots, black roots is that ancestry. Roots is the legacy. Roots is roots. what makes us strong and makes us able to survive yes. uh, life, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, nobody has nobody has survived life, right? Not, like nobody has managed to do it forever, but survive until it's time for us to go, right? Um, and yeah, I, I I wanted to ask you about that, and and if you if you feel the same way, I mean, I'm thinking you, absolutely. You, absolutely, you're singing and playing in the most traditional form of of, of black music there is. And um, yeah, I always tell people, man, my music is black as fuck. I mean, it's like, it's, <laughs> you know, it's uh, but it's it's you know what? I look at it like this. I was in. um, Where was I? England in one of these places. And um, I was playing this music, you know, and at the small little club it was a few years. It was years ago on my first record. And it, what's the name of that? Led Zeppelin, that guy, uh, mm-hmm. Robert Plant. Mm-hmm. He came Robert to my Plant. show and he was just like standing wow. there like real close to me and then, and then um, I finished and then you know, we talked and he was like, man, man, you sound like this person, this person, that person, blind Willie Johnson, all these old people. Some of them, I didn't even know who they were mm-hmm. because I have my go-to people, you know, like Skip James, Robert Johnson, mm-hmm. Harlem Wolf. But, and I was just thinking like, damn, Black Roots music. I'm like, what a garden that we all get to pick from. You know what I mean? That's all it is that those ancestors, like some people like the Rockefellers, the Bushes, whatever, Trump, they, oh, my parents and grandparents left me all this money. But what our uh, ancestors left us was this legacy, this sound, this garden that we could pick from forever. Mm-hmm. And, and it'll feed us. You know, even as I started Fantastic Negrito, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 52 years old. 
I'm an old you're dude. Young, you're young, but, brother. But I'm just saying, people were like, young, brother. Yeah. But yeah, people were like, yeah, you got to start a music career now. I was like, when I've been trying to start a career, I'm just playing this music. But those, my ancestors now, I think about all the time, they feed me. I ride on their back because of this, this expression. And they feed you too, because you're an MC. Mm -hmm. And you have these gifts that have come all the way down to the, some of the first people that were brought here. And I remember my grandmother said to me, they would say interesting things, man, these Southern people. She was like, she was like, yeah, great grandma. Yep, she would do, you know, we call them Negro spirituals. And she was like, honey, she said, white people thought we were sad. We weren't sad. She didn't even explain it. I was like, damn, I just, it stayed in my head forever. Mm. White people thought we were sad. We weren't sad. Mm. And one of the other powerful things she said to me, she was, I was like, grandma, tell me about segregation. I got, I got <laughs> sat down, let me get my tea. It's going to be a long night. And she was like, oh, she said, we didn't have no problem with white people because they were country people. I was like, what? She said, honey, we, she always said honey first. She said, mm -hmm. and, and they're from Virginia, very close to Carolina. Mm -hmm. She would say, your great, great grandfather, they knew they bought their own farm. We had our own hogs. We had our own livestock. We didn't have to ask anybody for anything. Man, that made me start growing weed. Mm. <laughs> that made, with, with my yeah. homies, I'm like, let's all grow weed. That made me put out a record called The Last Days of Oakland. Stop asking permission. Mm. Stop asking record labels to validate us. Like, they're interested in profit and money we're interested in legacy and spirituality so yes man i ride on the shoulders the backs of my ancestors just like you and it's powerful medicine it is it is it's 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 the the best medicine there is and exactly. that's actually a perfect time to uh, i'd love to see a clip of some of your music xavier sure so, i think i have a clip of i think we did a live performance of a, a song I did called Chocolate Samurai, which the actual YouTube video, I- <laughs> Speaking I of dope that. titles, I love, no, I haven't okay. seen it, but I love okay. the title, Chocolate, yeah, Chocolate Samurai. Samurai. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I got a whole beautiful. Beautiful. philosophy about that. And, uh -huh. but what I did with the original video, you know, the pandemic was on it, like you got to do a music video. So I crowdsourced it to people all around the world, including Sweden. And I got everybody to be in the video and they sent their part in. So. It's either going to be that one or it's when I was on the uh, late night show with Stephen Colbert and we just, we had to perform live and it was like one of the first live stream videos. Wow. Cool. Yeah. That was about, they were like, you got to be six feet apart. You shoot it yourself. And I was like, wow, different. So uh, it was raw and nasty. And we just, uh, we brought, we did it right in my little um, storefront studio. Okay. Beautiful. Let's check it out. What's going on, world? Fantastic Negrito here in Oakland, California. So much has changed. It's six feet right there. Well, I'm going to do some playing in here. And the first thing I want to do is make the room safe. Actually, more than six feet. All right.
Stuff right there in West Oakland, man. West Oakland is a lot of history there, man. A lot of history, but some really good vibrations. I'm glad to be down there recording. And you know, people got to come to West Oakland, they want to record. Man, I remember I was doing um something with Sting, mm-hmm. and I was like, Man, you got to come to West Oakland, bro. You want to, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he came, yeah. he came too. That was like actually my last session right before quarantine was with him so yeah we got we were able to cut some but it was they're looking around like damn is it cool i'm like man it's cool yeah 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 yep. so man i know you're gonna play something now yeah so uh i think this clip i'm gonna show you is a live clip too it's from uh the biggest festival in scandinavia is damn. called the rock it's called the roskill the festival you might have been here or Roskilde? if you haven't been roskill it's in denmark Okay. Uh, it's it's a really big festival, and uh, yeah, if you haven't been, you will definitely come here. Uh, you know, uh, by the grace of the virus, by the time that leaves us, and right. festivals are again possible. Anyway, Man, so this must know. be about. This is a song from called Mistank. So I write in Swedish. Right. Yeah. Because I find that's a, a good way to reach people in this part of the world. No, I just gotta, um, you know, that's your, and, your and to keep it really direct. And, and Swedish is my second language. And I think I have a kind of healthy irreverence for the language. So I I twist it. I make up words. I, I, I put oh, together words best. that that haven't been done before just to be able to, you know, it, it, the Swedish language is my clay that I use to mold mold these exactly. messages and feelings. Anyway, this song is called Mistanked, which means suspect. And it's just basically about, you know, being black, brown, person of color in Sweden and how uh, you get, you know, followed around in stores by the clerks Damn. or how the, how the cops stop you or you, how all the times I wasn't uh, let into clubs or I was stopped by the police and, and basically Damn. saying, uh, that's crazy, uh, man. In yeah, Sweden. it's it's the same story, man. It's the same story. It's a global story. Um, so that's what what this is. And it's basically, I wanted to, you know, I write a lot about these issues of racism and, and anti-racism and so forth. Uh, and I, a lot of times I want those tracks to be uplifting and hopeful because I'm also talking to, to people like myself. And I want to give them right. some power and some strength. So uh, it's also basically a, 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 a song uh, where my conclusion is that I'm longing for the, you know, the next generation and the generation after that, that will have freed themselves from these, from being limited by these constructs. So that's basically uh, uh, this track, it's called Mistank. Tom 
Nederland, Nooien, Zwaaien, Heuk. Yeah. Denna låten handlar också om Skandinavien. So many layers. Like when I'm listening to it, it's like that. Um, you know, it's, musically, you know, feels like kind of the '70s, like Earth, Wind, and yeah, Fire. Yeah, it's old soul. It's old soul. Right. Yeah. And then it's yeah. like, and then your flow like reminds me of a lot of like kind of '90s, even a little bit, a little bit of pop, but you got your own thing. And then <laughs> yeah. a lot of times when, as an American, when I'm hearing, um, you know, rap in foreign languages, it's strange but i feel like yeah the way you're doing it like just w flipping the words and the flow it's like oh yeah you have a this guy it sounds almost like english mm -hmm. so yeah. it's pretty interesting that's it sounds great yeah. wow that's well cool, you know man. you sorry know I, to hear I, about I, your friend too hey sorry to yeah, hear about your friend that's 
It's yeah, terrible. thank you. I, I haven't seen I haven't seen any like video of her since. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was just it just took me that I haven't seen her in such a long time. You know, it's terrible, uh, man. Wow, she's in. She's in. She took the step into the next life. But but speaking of Xavier, you talked a lot about past lives and 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 being reborn and things of that nature. Oh hell yeah. Do you, do you feel, have you ever felt uh, any of your past lives, have, have they reminded themselves to you in any way? Do they well, manifest at any point? Are they, do, are they with you or are they just uh, in the sub, in the substrata? Well, I'll tell you the one thing, man, I spent three weeks in a coma. Wow. And when that wow. happens, man, you, you know, you're Damn. skating on the realm Mm. of this other existence and this Do other you remember anything from that oh, i remember it man i i not i remember it vividly like it happened yesterday and i wrote down everything that happened in my coma after i uh woke from it and so i believe um a couple things number one there's no mystery we came from the dust we came from the universe we're spirits and our past lives and our ancestors, all that lives among us. And when we honor it, when we honor the tradition, we're stronger and we're richer and we're more protected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not only did I, do, I, do I feel it, but I experienced it in a coma, just mm -hmm. walking through those lives. You know what I mean? And it was, uh, you know, one day I'll write a, a book like you, and I'll mm. talk about my coma experience, which was, you know, it was, I can't, it, there's no words humanly I can say to make you feel what that was like. Yeah. It was, uh, it was it, out of this world experience, and I guess it should have been, because you're mm. going to die, but then you don't die, and you're, you know, you, you, you stay on the earth. And how, and how did you, you have work? Come, how did you come back for that from that? I mean, how how was who were you when you woke up? Well, I was a recovered narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, that's what it took. That's what it took. Yes, to, it to took. Cure you. That's what it, it took, took, man. I had to it go took you to the people. edge of edge of existence. Yes. Wow. I had to see these lies, and I had to walk through them, and I had to sit down, and I had to literally float in the water, and I had to literally <laughs> sit in the ceremony. Hmm. Remember where we started out? This conversation started with the word gratitude. Yes, sir. I imagine you have a, a very close relationship to that word in a, in a deeper sense. Oh, man. I mean, when you, you know, I couldn't, you know, they're like, you can't, you know, I, can't, I can move this hand, but I can't move this hand. I can only move okay. my fingers, but I'm still, you know, I write You're able and play. to play still. Yeah. yeah, I write and play and all that on my own records. I mean, um, <laughs> but I had to, I had to reinvent it. I had to say, Okay, this is an obstacle. So from this obstacle, we will now become more powerful. And from all the obstacles we've been we've talked about, and that's what's great about healing and accountability is that we take all these obstacles and challenges, and we get out of the culture of uh, blame because that can hurt us too, and we just embrace like how powerful it makes us, and we also confront, you know, the perpetrators, but we also embrace this identity of powerful people and yeah. um you know that that's what means the most of me from surviving a coma and having to rebuild everything i i couldn't i couldn't wipe my own ass mm. you know, imagine mm. that mm. i couldn't do it so um oops they tell me to get off the phone they just passed a note to me because i have <laughs> something <laughs> yeah yeah because i there have something go. coming but anyway yeah. so <laughs> i'll be saying it off the phone. <laughs> Hey, but it was a great, hey, this they is how conversation, in line. this yeah, is how it man. should be, this is natural, it's like talking to a friend, when I yeah. come to Sweden, uh, you know, I expect to uh, Oh man, see you. It, when you come to Sweden, I, I'm, I'm taking you around, man, I'll well, show you this make place. Sure, show, let's exchange information in this, in, on, on, what do you call that, social media, let's do all that. Absolutely, it was an honor to meet you, brother. Man, same and here, to, man, and and to get to listen to you. I didn't know that you, much and, about the music, I was, you know, I was surprised, I, I was like, wow, this his brother can flow, man. You have a great yeah, sense of you. the music and the tradition and uh, really, really honored. And lo I look forward to going on the rabbit hole of your music now. Yeah, man. Thank you, brother. And the same, you, you're overflowing with 
creativity and wisdom. You know, I can feel your, I can feel your wisdom. And like you said, you're an elder, you know, you only got a couple of years on me, but yet, and still, you know, yeah, that's you know, one thing I think my dad and your dad had a, a, a few things in common, I'm sure, but, but definitely the tough love part was one of them. What am I, my, my dad would always say, you know, I'll send you to Harlem. So you, so you learn some street smarts and then, and he spent a lot of time in Nigeria himself. And he'd always say, you know, if I was misbehaving or something, it's like, I'm going to send you to Nigeria. So you learn how to respect your elders. So did, did you, you know, go? respect, well, I, I haven't been yet. He never said, okay. you know, he never said, he did send me to Harlem, but uh, how was that? How was that in Harlem? Oh, I, I yeah, I love Harlem. I, I spent a lot of time. I wrote my book when I was in, I was in Harlem spending okay, time. Cool. I wrote my That's book beautiful. there. It's, my family was from there, so I needed to channel, you know, be yeah. around, be on the same streets that they that they once walked to be able to channel exactly. those spirits. But, but, but anyway, brother, it was. All right, uh, man. We'll be. It in was touch. an honor, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna tell my my assistant to hook us up. Good yeah, to talk stay to you. And to me. And, uh, yeah. Keep blessing us with it. that with your soul, man. I definitely will. It's been the year of the rapper for me. I, I just I worked with E40 this year. Oh wow! I worked with Legend. Tank. I did it. I did a bunch of records with, with rappers, so let's do it. Peace, man. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Peace out. Peace All out. right. Late. Wow. <laughs> Thanks again to Fantastic Negrito and Timbuktu uh, for joining us. And you can learn about uh, Fantastic Negrito's music and download uh, the latest album, Have You Lost Your Mind Yet, at fantasticnegrito.com. And for Timbuktu's music, go to www.timbuk.com. And you. Um, and if you haven't yet purchased a drop of midnight, um, you're in for a treat. Please visit baybookfest.org forward slash bookstores. You can be linked to places to buy it. And um, I am Sherilyn Parsons and uh, so delighted uh, to have experienced this with both of you. Um, you've been watching Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Mm -hmm.